All right, we're going to go ahead and continue where we left off. Uh, so we've got the another word problem here. Daily revenue are achieved by selling Xbox to candy. So we have a revenue that's given here, and we have a daily cost that's given here. Uh, it says how many boxes must be sold to maximize the profit, and what will be the maximum profit. So uh, with this kind of problem, what we want to use is the revenue and the cost. So recall from the previous section, we said that profit is equal to the revenue minus the cost. And we're given both of these formulas here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in the, the revenue formula, 9.5x minus 0.04x squared. And we want to subtract the cost formula. Now remember that this has to be put all into the parentheses because you're subtracting the entire cost equation. So we have to make sure we remember to put that minus sign in there. Then we're going to distribute the minus sign. And so that's why we need the parentheses here, because if we didn't do that, you might, add, you might have minus 1.25, but then you'd leave this as a plus, and that would be incorrect. So I want to make sure you have the, the you do the correct uh, formula here is minus C of X, so you're subtracting all of that. Now we're going to combine the like terms together. So I have negative 0.04 X squared. Nothing else goes with that. I have the X terms, 8.25 X, and then I have minus 250. So I have my A and I have a B. We got the word maximize. So for all the problems in this section, uh, that have minimize or maximize, we want to find the vertex. So the formula we want to use is negative B over 2A. So we have these, that we'll go ahead and put together. We have negative 8.25X. We're dividing that by two times negative 0.04. Now you want to be careful when you put this into your calculator. Okay, so we have minus negative 8.25, on the bottom, we want to do 2 times negative 0.04. Okay, so make sure you're putting all that in parentheses when you put this in the calculator. Because if you don't put these parentheses here, then you're going to get the wrong number when you put that into the calculator. So if you put that in the calculator, you should get 103.125. Now, this is not an exact number this time that we have. We can't sell a fraction of a box. So if we round down to 103, at this point, we are not going to reach our maximum profit. So in fact, what we want to do is we want to sell 104 boxes instead. So again, the reason why we're doing that is because at 103, if you imagine a, uh, a parabola like this, at the very top, that would be at 103.125 right there. But if we sell 103 only, that means we're going to be slightly less than that on this parabola. So at 103, we haven't actually reached our maximum profit. Because we can't sell a fraction of a box, we'll have to sell one more box. And at one more box, it'll be, it'll be over the amount. But then at that point, at 104 boxes, we would have reached our maximum profit at that point. So because we can't sell a individual or a fraction of a box, that's why instead we're going to sell one more to make it 104 boxes. So 104 would actually be the answer in this case. Now, if we want to find the profit, that means that we have to put 104 back into the original equation here. And so we'll put 104 squared plus 8.25 times 104 and then minus 250. So we just want to go ahead and put this into uh, our calculator. So let me go ahead and we'll do that real quick here. So I'm going to show the different steps here uh, as I go through that. And so this is going to be negative 432.64. And then I have the next one, 104 times 8.25, you should get this. Now, of course, you can, if you have a 
graphing calculator or something like that. You'll be able to put all this in uh, at once, but I'm doing this all kind of separate here. Okay, so I'm putting this in separately. Uh, so 432.64 negative, and we're adding 858, and then we're adding, or subtracting, I should say, negative 250. And we get, as a result, 175.36. Okay, so 175.36 is going to be the profit. So notice that I did not use 103.25. I did not put inside here. That's because we said that we had to sell 104 boxes. So I want the profit that goes along with the exact number that I sold, 104 boxes. That's why my answer will be 175.36. And so this we finished this one. So uh, the ones that we did before were ones where formulas were provided. That's the ones we did yesterday, but these two are now ones where we have to come up with the formula on our own. So these are gonna involve uh, finding two different equations and then substituting on that. So that's what we'll do on this one here. So it says, among all pairs of numbers whose difference is 24. So the word, the word difference here means subtraction. So if I let X and Y represent the two numbers, one equation I would, I would have here would be this one here, X minus Y equals 24. Now, if it says sum is 24, I would have X plus Y equals 24. So I have a minus here because of the word uh, difference uh, that I have. So that's one equation. Now it also says, the word product. So product means that you're multiplying X and Y together. So I would have X times Y. Well, we have to make this uh, some kind of an equation. So I'm gonna put a, a P for product and just do P equals X, Y. So now these are gonna be the, the two equations uh, that we have. And so then we're gonna put one equation into the other one. Uh, so with this here, we're gonna do a substitution. Now, it doesn't matter which equation that you are, uh, what variable that you solve for here. Uh, so you can solve for either X or Y, and then we'll substitute it into the bottom one. Typically, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just leave everything all in terms of X. So what I'm gonna do for this equation right here is I'm going to solve for a Y. I'm gonna solve for Y, and then we'll put it into this bottom. So if I solve for y, I'm basically going to add the y to the other side and subtract 24. So I'm gonna get y is equal to x minus 24. So again, add the y and then subtract 24 and you'll get this. So now this one, I'm gonna put into the, uh, the, the p function that I have here, the equation. So instead of the y, I'm gonna put x minus 24. And then I get x squared minus 24x when I multiply that out. So now we have an equation that represents the, the product. So in order to get the answer, now it doesn't matter if it says minimum or maximum, you're always going to do the same procedure. You want to find the vertex. So I'm going to find the vertex with this. Now in this case, the a is 1 and b is negative 24. So if I find the X coordinate of the vertex, I'm gonna use the formula we talked about yesterday, negative B over two A. And I'm gonna put in, I have negative, negative 24 over two times A, two times one. And so I get 24 over two, which is equal to uh, 12. So 12 is gonna be one of my numbers, but it says find a pair which means that we have to find both numbers. So now we wanna find the, we, can, we, have, we have X, but we have this equation right here that we can use to find the Y. So Y is equal to 12 minus 24, which is equal to negative 12. So the pair here is going to be 12 and negative 12. And you would just list that there uh, in Lumen. Uh, when you put your answer, you'll just list them like that. Okay, so that would be, that's your, the answer. Okay, so again, that one involves finding two equations. We have one of them. The difference of two numbers is 24. The other number is the product. 
Okay, so the product was this one here. Product means you're multiplying, uh, and that's why we have this equation set up. Took the first equation, solved for y, and then we substituted it into the second equation to get our quadratic that we have to use. That the, the only way that you can use the vertex formula is you have to have a quadratic first. Okay, so I can't do that with like x minus 24 because that's not a, uh, a quadratic. Okay, so we have to make sure we have a quadratic first before we actually use the, uh, the vertex formula. So we have that one. Let's go ahead and do the next one is going to be kind of a similar setup. We have to find two equations and then we'll plug one into the other to get the answer. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this next one. Uh, we have 900 feet of fencing. We want to enclose a rectangular field that borders a river. So only three sides need fencing. Let's go ahead and draw a picture of what that would be. So here's the river. And then we have uh, something like this, a rectangular field. Uh, so therefore, the, this side, the, the river forms a natural boundary there. So we don't need any fencing along that back side. So we only have three sides here that require fencing, as it says here. It says, what's the largest area that can be enclosed? All right, so first thing we wanna do is set up some variables. Now, it doesn't matter if you wanna use length and width or X's and Y's, doesn't really make a difference. I'm gonna go ahead and use X and Y. I'll let X equal the short distance and Y is gonna equal the longer distance right here. Now, if we add all that up together, all three sides have to add up to the 900 feet of fencing. So I would have a 2X and a Y, and that's gonna equal 900 feet of fencing. So that's the first formula that, uh, that we're using. Fencing material is gonna be used to create all three of these sides. So whatever all three of these sides add up to, it has to use up the entire 900 feet that I have there. Now, the other one is if I, Imagine that this wasn't closed and it was a rectangle. I would have the area would equal x times y on this. So now that I have these two formulas, I can solve for one and put it in the other one. Again, most of the time, I typically want to solve for y. And so uh, that's what we'll do on this one here. Now, it does, you don't have to solve for y. It doesn't matter. If we had everything all in terms of y, you could still actually use the vertex formula. It just means that you'd find the y value first, then you can find the x value later. So it doesn't really matter which one that you solve for. Typically, though, you want to try and avoid fractions if you can. So like this one, if I tried to solve for x, then I'd have to divide by 2, and I'd have some kind of a fraction in there. So if you don't want to deal with that, then we can solve for y instead. So that's what we'll do right here. So solve for the y. So y is going to equal 900 minus, we'll just subtract the 2x, so 900 minus 2x. Okay, and then we're gonna take this and we'll substitute it into the, the y right there. So I get x times 900 minus 2x. Okay, uh, and the one last thing we'll do is multiply this out because we wanna make sure we know what our a and b are to use the vertex formula. 900x minus 2x squared is now going to be our parabola model for this. Now, uh, what this represents here is that, because you might be wondering, well, this is a parabola, so but we have a rectangle. So how do we have a parabola that's describing a rectangle? Well, what this is actually doing is it's giving you different values for the area based on what X is. And so it'll, it'll, pop, it'll be a, um, one that kind of opens down like this. And so the, the way that that actually works, if I can actually draw here, uh, is it looks, it looks something like this. This is X and this is area. So there's all different kinds of areas to check, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the X value that's gonna give us the largest area. That's what it asks for here. What's the largest area that can be enclosed? So this is the reason why we have to find a vertex because at that point up there, there'll be some X value for which the area will be at its maximum. There's other, area, other values for X we can try, but there's only one that's gonna give us the largest area. So it's a model that is describing the area of this that we have. All right, so now we're gonna do X is equal to negative B over two A. 
And the, we have to be careful on this. The B is 900 and the A is negative two. Remember that the A always comes in front of the X squared variable and B comes in front of the X to the first power on that. So we're gonna do negative 900 divided by two times A, two times negative two. Okay, so now we have that 900 divided by, by four. And so we can just put that into the calculator to get the X value, which is 225. Okay, so 225. Now we wanna find the Y value. We already have this equation solved for Y, so we can just put that in to find that, 900 minus two times 225. And that's gonna equal 900 minus 450, which means you'll get 450 left over, okay? Uh, so that's the two side. Now, sometimes they may ask you for what dimensions will produce the largest area. And if it asks for that, we found it. It's going to be 225 and then 450 is what you put down for the answer. However, this one is asking you for what is the largest area that can be enclosed. So to find the area, all we have to do is put it back into the area equals x times y formula, since we have both of the x and the y. Likewise, we could have also taken 225 and put 225 into the area formula as well. So two different ways we can do that, but it might be easier for us to do 225 and then times 450, x times y there. And that's gonna give us 101, 250. And that's gonna be in terms, each of these, by the way, are in terms of feet because feet was the unit that was given to us. And so the unit here is going to be feet squared. Okay, so we have feet and feet squared uh, for that. So that's gonna be our final answer uh, right here. That's what they're asking for. But the dimensions would be 225 and 450 in case it asked uh, for that one. So that would be, that's gonna be it for this section as far as the problems are concern here. So we just had a couple of those application problems at the end regarding the uh, quadratics. So what we'll do next is we're going to go on to section 4.1 and 4.2. Now, if you haven't, if you've already printed these notes out like before yesterday, um, that means that uh, even yesterday afternoon or before that, uh, these notes are going to be a little bit different. Um, there's a different way that Lumen or uh, the, the book here that we're kind of following uh, is using. Uh, and so I'm actually kind of having changed my notes to reflect what this is and also reflect what Lumen is actually asking uh, in there as well. So these problems, if you, uh, if you print this out uh, like yesterday, then uh, they're going to be a little bit different right now. They are updated on my website and also they are updated within Lumen itself. So if you were to click on those notes now, uh, they're going to be accurate. So let's go ahead and, and move on to uh, 4.1, which is on polynomial functions. So there's one aspect of this that uh, if you watch the videos, by the way, that I have on my website, um, those videos, there it'll be kind of talking about the older version of teaching with this. I'll need to update that. However, when you go to Lumen, I did go ahead and attach uh, a video that is not mine, but there's a couple of videos that are that are done by different people that actually reflect the kind of the current way that you want to do these kind of problems. And so just a heads up on there, you might see some other videos besides mine, but they'll also give you some help uh, as well. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about polynomial functions. Uh, we have a polynomial that's written here. Tip, polynomial base just means it's it's made up of different terms that we have there. Now, the, uh, the terms that you have on this uh, would be um, the highest to lowest power is typically how the terms are written. Now, the A of N is the, uh, the coefficient in front of the X that has the highest power. So we're going to say that N is equal to the highest power, and A of N would be that coefficient that comes in front. The reason why I'm introducing it to you this way is because in later sections, we're actually going to use the A of N and A of O. Uh, we'll use that uh, in order to find different things. In this section, we are gonna use the A of N uh, as well uh, for, for finding something that's called N behavior, which we'll get to a little bit later. 
to the end of the formula, this is always the highest power and this has a name, it's called the degree. So it's the largest exponent of the, the polynomial. So uh, in order for it to be a polynomial, here's the rules. It can only have whole, so this is important right here. Uh, so whole number, whole number exponents, get rid of that line there. Okay, so whole number exponents. Okay, there means there's no negative exponents, no fractions or decimals. And also a polynomial must be a, a smooth line, which means that we don't have any disconnected pieces and we don't have any breaks or corners like a cusp like this, something like that. We don't have that kind of thing happening in the graph. So uh, as long as you have these two things there, that tells us it's gonna be a, a polynomial. So we're going to take a look at some examples and determine whether it's a polynomial or not. So if it is a polynomial, they want you to indicate the, the a sub n there, which would be again, the coefficient in front of the term that has the highest power. We can only do this if it actually is a polynomial. So that's what we're gonna determine first, determine whether it's a polynomial and then find the a of n. Now, as I mentioned up here, the polynomial has to have whole number exponents. There's no negative exponents, no fractions, no decimals. So that's what we're gonna look at to determine whether it's a polynomial or not, whether it has negatives, fractions, or decimals in the exponent position. Now this one here, we do have a fraction for this third term. However, uh, in part A there, the fraction is, uh, has nothing to do with the exponent. The exponents here are all whole numbers. So for this one, this is going to be a, a polynomial. Okay, so the first one definitely is a polynomial. It has whole number exponents, no negatives, no fractions. Next, we want to determine the degree and the a, a sub n. Okay, the degree is the highest power you see here. So we would say degree is three on this one. And the a sub n is the, the number that comes in front of the x that has the highest power. In this case, the a sub n is going to be negative two. And that's how you would do that. How you would actually say something like this, this polynomial, you would say it is a degree three polynomial. You kind of say it in that order. So degree three polynomial would tell you that it's a polynomial with the highest exponent is three. That's basically what that, that tells you. Okay, and so that's gonna be the, the the answer for, for part A, it's a polynomial, degree is three. A sub n is that number that comes in front of the x with the highest power. So that's where the negative two came from. It's the coefficient right there. Let's do a couple other ones. Okay, so again, remember for it to be a polynomial, no fractions for the exponents, no fractional exponents, no negative exponents. Okay, uh, and so this right here, we have the square root of x minus five. And if you rewrite this as an exponent, remember that square roots can be written as a one half power. So we have f of x is equal to x to the one half minus five. And so uh, that right there tells us that because it's a fractional exponent, not a polynomial. Okay, it's not a polynomial because of that reason. Okay. So if it's not a polynomial, then we don't have to worry about finding the degree and the a of n. That only applies if it is a polynomial. And so that's all we have to do for part B. We already determined it's not a, not a polynomial because of the one half power. You can't have fractions, decimals, or negative exponents if it's a polynomial. All right, now the next one, uh, we don't have a square root anymore. We have an x squared in the bottom. Okay, now, however, this one here, if we rewrite that, that's equal to five x to the negative two power because the square, we can bring that up above the division bar and then the exponent turns negative. So this again, not a polynomial. It's not a polynomial because we've got a negative exponent. So again, negative exponents are not allowed if you have a polynomial. Again, since it's not a polynomial, we don't have to worry about finding the degree or the, 
the A is sub n. So we'll move on to the next one. So again, uh, it's negative because your brain, whenever you have an X in the bottom of a fraction, that's never going to be a polynomial. You can't have an X in the bottom of a fraction because it always will turn into some kind of a negative exponent. Okay, next one is f of x equals six. Now notice that there's no x here. So the question is, well, what would that be equivalent to? Well, this we can actually write this as six x to the power of zero. Any x that's raised to a power of zero turns into a one. And so that this is equivalent how we can write that. So because of this reason, the zero is actually included. That it, it's a, it is a polynomial here. Okay, it's not negative, zero is not negative. It's not a fraction or a decimal, so it's okay. Okay, so whole number exponents, whole numbers actually include the zero. So it is a polynomial. Now what you would say here is the degree is zero. So it's a degree zero polynomial. And the a sub n is the number that comes in front of the x with the highest power. Well, since the only x is x to the power of zero, the a of n is gonna be six. And then that would be it for that one. Okay, and the next one we're going to do part E. We don't have it written out as uh, different terms like we've had before for the other ones. So this one, it might make sense to multiply these out first. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to foil this out. Okay, so x times x is going to be x squared. Then we have a 5x and a minus 2x. That's going to be a 3x. Negative 2 times 5 is going to be negative 10. So we multiply that all out. That way we could see what the exponents are. Now, all the exponents we see here, uh, they're all whole numbers. And so this one is also going to be a polynomial. Okay, the uh, degree is two, because that's the highest power that you see there. And the other thing we'll do is a sub n. a sub n is the number in front of the x with the highest power. So in this case, a sub n is one. So if you're not sure what it is, you can always multiply it out to, to, to see whether it's a polynomial or not. Okay, so next thing we're going to talk about is a turning point. So let me draw right here for turning point. This might make more sense if I have a drawing. So let's suppose we have a graph that looks like this. These points right here that I'm pointing to with the arrow, okay, those would be considered turning points. It's a place where the graph changes direction. Now you might also have something that does this, like a cube shaped graph. Uh, that also right here, that's considered a place where the graph changes direction. So that would be considered a turning point as well. Okay, so that's what it is. A place where the graph either changes direction or maybe there might be a bend in the graph like the case here where there's a, a cube. Okay, so those are, those are called turning points. So it's, it's, it's a peak or a valley, or like I said, also could be where you have a bend in the graph like this. So the, the rule here is if you want to find out how many turning points a graph can have, what the, what's the most it can have is this rule right here. If the n is the degree, we already talked about that before, n is the highest power of the polynomial. If n is the degree, if the rule here is the polynomial can have at most n minus one turning points. So it, it can have as much as one less than the degree. That's how many it can have. Now this may not be the exact number that it has. It might have less than this, but it says that's the most turning points it can have is n minus one turning points. So for this question here, it says up to how many turning points can y equals x squared minus x to the fifth have? Okay, well, the answer, you're gonna take the degree and just subtract one. So we can say at most five minus four, or I'm sorry, five minus one, equals four turning points, turning points here. Okay, so that's, that's the most it can have.
Okay, so at most four. And that's, that's all you have to do for that. So the maximum number of turning points, you just take the degree, subtract one. That's going to be your answer. It might have less than, than four turning points, but it just means that we cannot have any more than four uh, turning points. So that's what that means. Okay, so one way that we found out whether it's a polynomial or not is by the equation. Uh, another question that you will see in Lumen is they're going to give you some graphs, and they'll ask you which ones could possibly be uh, polynomials. So that's what we're going to take a look at next year. Which of the following can be a degree three polynomial? Okay, so we have different choices and we have to select which one uh, is a degree three polynomial. So this, in order to do this, we have to take a look at a couple things that we've already talked about already. First of all, uh, in order for it to be a polynomial, it has to be a smooth curve with no breaks or disconnected pieces. If we take a look at our answer choices right here, we're going to go ahead and cross out B and C. The reason why is because this, for B, we have a place where it's not connected. And then for part C, we have a, some kind of a corner, like a crease that's here. You got this line that kind of goes to a, a corner, a sharp corner there. So it has to be a smooth curve. And so we're going to cross out C as well. So now we have either both A and D, at least we know those are smooth curves. So those are both candidates for, could be a polynomial. Now, the thing that you have to look at here is the word degree three here. Degree three, that has to do with what we just talked about with turning points. Remember that a, uh, you could have at most N minus one turning points. So because it's degree three right here, this says right here, this means at most two turning points. Okay, that's what it means. So it can have at most two turning points. So therefore, we have to eliminate A. And the reason why we're crossing that one out is because it has one, two, three, has four different turning points there. That's too many turning points, which means that D is the only possible answer here. It's, it's got a, it's degree three means it can have at most two turning points. This one does have two turning points, so that does work. And it's a smooth curve with no disconnected pieces or corners, sharp corners, nothing like that. So uh, that would be our answer would be D. So that's the way that you can kind of tell by looking at the different drawings. Uh, you'll just pick the one that, that works, uh, that, that has a smooth curve and it fits the turning points. Next one we're going to do is this form a degree three polynomial whose zeros are negative two, zero, and two, and it has to pass through the point negative one, comma six. So there's a couple different problems. So there are some written examples for you uh, in Lumen. So when you do these kind of problems, uh, you can follow along with what I'm going to do here in the notes. But there's also some additional uh, written examples for you to look at. So it won't be the exact problem that you're working on. It'll be a similar one, but uh, that's provided for you in Lumen as an extra resource for this. Okay, so form a degree three polynomial with these zeros and it passes through negative one, six. Now the first thing we wanna do is write the general format of the polynomial. We, we, learned, we talked about this in a uh, previous section that in order, if you have a, if R is a zero, then, x minus r is a factor. Okay, this is the factor theorem. We talked about this before when we did the long division and synthetic division before uh, we, we learned that. We're going to use that again right here. because It's going to be kind of a similar problem. Form a degree three polynomial, and then we have these zeros here, negative two, zero, and two. Uh, we'll worry about the point a little bit later. First of all, I want to create the create this by using x minus r. So we're gonna put x minus, x minus, and x minus. One factor for each of the given zeros. And then all we're gonna do is just plug in the zeros for each of these. Okay, so we have x minus negative two, x minus zero, x minus two. 
Now we're going to simplify this. So what's going to happen is that's going to form a polynomial that is, starts with f of x, but there's going to be some kind of a coefficient that comes in front. So I'm going to use letter a for the coefficient, and I'm just going to go ahead and put uh, actually, let me go ahead and put the x first because that's x minus zero. So that's just going to be an x. And I have x plus two, x minus two that comes after it. So I simplified the, uh, the factors that I had, and I just put a letter a out front. So letter a is what we're going to be using here to, we have to try, we have to solve for a. So that way we get the specific polynomial that matches this. Now, in order to do that, we're going to use the point that we have here. Now, this right here is x. The 6 is going to be our f of x. So for the point that they give us, first coordinate is always x, second coordinate is always f of x. We're going to plug the point into our polynomial. So I'll put everywhere I see f of x, I'm going to put in a 6, like that. Everywhere I see an X, I'm gonna put in negative one. So I have negative one, negative one plus two, negative one minus two. So by putting all that in, that's gonna simplify, uh, we'll simplify everything. And then all we have left to do is solve for A. Okay, so we have six equals A, and then let's, multiply, let's do all this. This is gonna be negative one, this is one, and this is negative three, so I have negative one, one, negative three. If I multiply all this, all that together, I get negative one and negative three is three times one is three. So I get three A. Divide both sides by three and I get A is equal to two. So now I know what my exact polynomial is gonna be. I have two times uh, two X, and I have x plus two, x minus two. And that right there is gonna be the specific polynomial uh, for this. It has those specific zeros, negative two, zero, and two. Also, it's gonna pass through the point negative one, six. That, allow, that, that a, a value out front allows us to be able to get this to go through that exact point, negative one, six. So that is gonna be, so this right here, is going to be our polynomial. We're gonna do another one of these a little bit later at the end of this section. We have a, a problem where we have a, a graph that's provided and we're gonna do the same thing, but we're just gonna read the information off of the graph besides what's given right here. So we'll come back to the, this a little bit later and we'll do the same thing, okay? Now, sometimes they'll, get, they'll ask you to, to do something with a point. This one right here, says specifically it has a coefficient of one. So now I don't have to, this one is a little bit easier, this the next example, because I don't have to worry about having it go through a certain point. So this one's a little easier. Okay, so it has a leading, a leading coefficient of one. So I should have put uh, leading in front of that. Okay, so it's actually a leading coefficient of one. That's what that means. Okay, so first we're going to, we know that's gonna be f of x equals, and then we know it's gonna be x minus x minus for each of these. For a degree three polynomial, zeros are negative three and one. Oh, by the way, the degree we didn't talk about up here, it says form a degree three polynomial. And in, in Lumen, you're gonna see this all multiplied out for the answer, but you don't need to worry about that. You can just leave it in the factor form. And Lumen will also accept that answer uh, as well. So you can just leave it like that. However, if you were to multiply this out, you have an X and then times an X times an X. You multiply all those together, that's gonna give you the degree three there. So this one's asking for degree three as well. So it says that the zeros are negative three and one. So I'll put negative three in here and one, which means that I can simplify it to x plus three and x minus one. Now what you might be thinking there, uh, you should be thinking is that this is actually not going to be the correct answer. And the reason why it's not is because the problem says form a degree three polynomial. If I multiply this part out right now, I'm only gonna get a square. So that's not gonna be the, the correct 
solution. So what we have to do is we have to modify this. And there's two different things we can do. So this type of problem uh, would probably be a mock a multiple choice situation where you just choose the correct answer. So we have a couple different possibilities. We can put a two right there. If we put a two on top, that means that if we multiply this together, the you'll get something with a square right here and then you'll multiply it by the X and you'll get a, an X cubed out of that. And that's gonna be our degree three. Or we have another possibility as well. So this is also going to be a possible solution. We could put the two on the X minus one. Now, again, each of these, if you take both of these and you set them equal to zero, you're still gonna get negative three and one as the answer. So it still meets the qualification of having these zeros here. Coefficient of one just means that there's a one in front of each, each of these groups here. So our A value in this case would be a one, but we have two different possibilities as the answer. And so uh, either one of these would actually be acceptable. The first one you have uh, a two up on top to where if you multiply this together, you'll get an X cubed. You'll get X cubed as well over here because if you take the second factor, multiply that out, you'll get x squared, and times x will give you x cubed. So either one of these, uh, you'll end up getting the answer. And then that's all you would have to do there in that case. Now, these powers that you see on top of here, you see the powers that are attached to each of these factor pieces. This has a name, and that's what we're going to talk about on the next page. The, the little factors here, the, the powers, it has a name and that's called multiplicity. That's this right here. So again, the, the two that I added to either of these factors, this is called a multiplicity. Multiplicity is the power that is on each of the factored pieces. So in order to find multiplicity, it has to be in a factored form. And so the, the powers that are on top of here, uh, we have a two and a one here or a one and a two, that is considered to be Multiplicity, and the way you would say that is that the the zero uh, for this first one I did earlier here, the the, the uh, zero of negative three there right there, that would have a multiplicity of two, and then the the zero of a one would have a multiplicity of one. That's how you basically would say that. Uh, and the, now the reason why we're concerned about multiplicities is because that is actually going to help us when we get to section four two it's gonna help us to be able to graph this. That's gonna tell us whether the graph crosses or touches the x-axis. So right here, this is the, the rule that I wrote out. This is something that I didn't have in the notes before, but I wanted to go ahead and write this out formally for you here. If it has an even, an even multiplicity, like two, four, or six, even multiplicity, the graph is going to touch at that zero, which means that it may do something like, graph will look something like that. It may come in from the bottom as well, but it'll come down and it'll touch at that point. If the graph crosses at that zero, that means it's going to look something like this. It could come, come down like that, or maybe it'll come up from above, something like that. But the graph is gonna cross, that means it'll cross through and keep on going. So if it touches, Generally, it's got a, some kind of like a parabola shape here, whether it's coming in from the top or the bottom, it doesn't matter. It will have some kind of a curve because it's got to touch it, so it's going to bounce in reverse directions. So if it has an even multiplicity, it's going to look like an X squared shape there at that point. So that's what, that's what multiplicity actually does for you. Uh, and so the types of problems that you'll see in Lumen, it's going to ask you to identify the zero, the multiplicity, and then you'll circle whether it crosses or touches. Um, this will all be uh, done online. So just type the answer in uh, for each of that. So what it'll do is it'll tell you, like it'll ask you to list, it'll, instead of having it uh, kind of listed like this, like I have here, uh, you'll just type all the zeros in on one line. So just type them all in at once. And then it'll ask you for the lower zero has a multiplicity of, and you'll type the answer in. The, the highest zero will have a multiplicity of, it'll, it'll ask you to enter it like that, so that way you know which ones it's referring to. And then you'll, it'll be a little pull down menu thing, a little pull down box, it'll ask you whether it crosses or touches. So 
that's how it'll ask it to you uh, in the homework in Lumen. So with, we have this example, 2x cubed, x minus 1 squared, x plus 2 to the fourth. It says indicate whether the graph crosses or touches the x-axis. So you want to find the zeros and multiplicities, as we see here, and then just indicate whether it crosses or touches. The very first one that we have here, I have 2x cubed. That's the first term. If I set that equal to 0, divide by 2 and take the cube root, we're going to get 0, which means that the first answer is going to be a 0. The multiplicity is the power that is attached to this particular factor. In this case, the, the power on the x is 3, and so I'm going to say 3 right there. Now, because the multiplicity is odd, that means that at this point, at x equals 0, the graph is going to cross the x-axis at 0. So that's how we, we want to do that. Let's take a look at the next piece. x minus 1 squared equals 0. If you take the cube root of both sides of this, you're going to get x minus 1 equals 0. And so x is equal to uh, positive 1. So, so again, square root. Now, we do technically have plus or minus, but plus or minus 0 is still 0. So that's why we just get one equation here we'll solve for. A 1 goes in there. Now, the multiplicity on this one is a 2. Okay, so a 2 is an even multiplicity, which means the graph is going to touch the x-axis when it crosses, when it, when it gets to the x value of, zero, of, x value of 1. The last one we have here is x plus 2 to the fourth power equals 0. What you would do is you take the fourth root of both sides, which means that you're going to get plus or minus 0, which is still 0. And then we get x is equal to negative, negative 2. Okay, So negative 2 uh, would be the other answer right here. The multiplicity of that is going to be a four, whatever the power on the factor piece is, that's the multiplicity. Because this multiplicity is even, we said that's going to touch the x-axis at that zero, so it touches it. So that's how you can work with multiplicities. They're important because it, it'll tell you again something about what the graph actually does, which we'll take a look at when we get to 4.2. All right, now the next thing we're going to talk about in this section is what's called end behavior. So end behavior is talking about what the graph does when x gets really, really big or really, really small. Okay, and that has to do with two things, the, the degree and then the a of n we talked about earlier. The a of n is the number that comes in front of the x with the highest power. That is going to tell you something about the graph. Okay. So we have some different shapes right here. And this is going to tell you what the graph is going to do. And these are some four different cases that we have. So I'll, I'll go ahead and explain each of these. The A of N, again, is the number that comes in front of the X with the highest power. The highest power is your degree that we call N. So depending on whether your N is even or odd, we have different shapes. So if N is even, and the number in front of the x with the highest power, the a of n, is positive, then the graph is going to do something like this. Now, of course, in the middle, it, it might go up and down and do some other stuff in the middle. But at the end, as s gets real big or real small, the graph is going to open up in each direction like that. Okay, so that's what it's going to do in that case. Uh, if your n is even, but the number that comes in from the x with the highest power is negative, then the graph's going to open down like that. It's going to uh, go down for each of those. Again, it might do something in the middle, but the graph will end by going down for both of those. We also have uh, n is odd, and the number in front of the x is positive. Then the graph will go down, and it's going to go up like that. Okay, Go down, and it'll go up. And then the last one that we have 
n is odd and a of n is less than zero. If we have an odd, an odd exponent that the highest power is odd and the number in front of that x with the highest power is negative, we have a situation where it's gonna go up and it's gonna go down like that. Again, it could go something in between, but it's gonna end up doing this. This is gonna come into play in the next section when we talk about graphs, because we're gonna use this as a, an aid for graphing. However, uh, for this problem, uh, it kind of has it in, uh, in here as that. So um, I'm gonna label, I'm gonna label these cases for you because I wanna write something off to the side over here because there's a problem in Lumen that has to do with uh, using infinity and things like that. So I wanna go ahead and look at these different cases, one, two, three, four, and talk about it in terms of infinity, okay? So let's talk about case number one, okay? As X approaches, that's what this little arrow means, as X approaches negative infinity, uh, F of X, approaches infinity, okay? That just means that as I go to the left, if X is going this direction towards negative infinity, the Y values are gonna go all the way up to positive infinity. So that's what that one means. As X approaches positive infinity, so going to the right, F of X also is going to approach infinity. So again, I'm writing this out like this because there is a problem in Lumen that's gonna be like, has you do like a fill in the blank kind of thing. And so I wanna make sure we kind of understand that notation for each of these. All right, so that's the way that one is going to uh, work. Number two, if I go to the left, so as X approaches negative infinity, F of X also approaches at infinity. So as I go to the left, the graph is going down. That's going to go down towards negative infinity. That's what this means here. The other one is that X approaches positive infinity. F of X is going to approach negative infinity in case number two here. Okay. So as X goes to positive infinity, so as you go to the right, the graph is going to continue to go down towards positive, down towards negative infinity. Number three that we have, case number three, as X approaches negative infinity, so as you approach this going to the left, the graph is going down. F of X approaches negative infinity. Okay, so as you, as you go to the left, it's gonna go down. That's what that one means. The other one, as X approaches infinity, F of X also approaches infinity. As you go to the right towards infinity, the Y values are gonna be going up as well. And then the last one, case number four, as X approaches negative infinity, F of X approaches infinity. As I go move to the left here, f of x is going up towards positive infinity. As x approaches positive infinity, f of x here is going to go down, f of x approaches negative infinity. Okay, so I just wanted to go ahead and run through all that terminology with you because again there's a problem in Lumen that has you kind of fill in the blanks with that and that way you can get all that from uh, these different cases, one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's kind of some, just some notation that works. So a little arrow here just means approaches. So as X approaches that infinity, F of X approaches infinity. It's the Y values, so that's what that means. Now, another thing that this talks about is uh, this book refers to as a power function of degree n. And so what it means is that you're gonna find some equation that looks like this, f of x equals a x to the n. A is a real number uh, where the a cannot be equal to zero and your n has to be uh, an integer, okay? This means that it's gonna ask you what 
equation does resemble as X gets very, very large. And so that's gonna be something that we're gonna also see in 4.2 that we'll have time to introduce today. Uh, it'll ask you what equation does this resemble? And all it ends up being is this ends up being the, the term that has uh, the X with the highest power, that term, that's gonna be what's referred to as the power function. So if it asks you for what the, what the graph resembles for very large or very small values of, of X here, then that's what it means. So we'll talk about that more when we get to the next section, but again, it's called the power function, just the, 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 leading, the leading term we have. So it's the X that has the highest power with whatever the coefficient is in front of it, that's gonna be your answer for the power function. We'll look at that a little bit later in 4.2. Now here's one last question that we're gonna do in 4.1 and then we'll, take, we'll jump into 4.2. Construct a polynomial function for the graph below. Again, this is a brand new problem that I just added actually like an hour ago. Okay, so that means that if you, uh, this, if you print out the, the graph, the, the, uh, the new notes right now, it'll have this problem written in there also in the written form as well. Uh, so this is something that's kind of new that we're going to do. I wanted to have one more example where we, we form a polynomial and it goes through a specific point. So we're going to do that on this one as well. So we have a, uh, this is drawn here. The, uh, these numbers indicate that the, all these boxes represent uh, one. Okay, we want to write a polynomial that where it goes through. So first of all, we want to go ahead and indicate the zeros. So we're going to read those directly from the graph itself. So if I find the, the zeros on here, it goes through at negative four, crosses at negative one, and also at two. Okay, so those are the given zeros that it has. So let's, let's first start out by writing the polynomial in the right form. Now we, we do want it to go through specific points here. So there's different points that we can grab off of the, the graph itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and put an A in there to indicate that we need to find that coefficient eventually. Okay, and so then uh, we're going to um, do X minus R for each of these. So X minus negative four, X minus negative one, X minus two. So you always want to do X, you always will do X minus every single time. It's always X minus, and you just put the zeros in there for that. Next thing we're going to do is simplify that. So we get X plus four, X plus one, and then X minus two. All right. So now that's going to be the the general polynomial. Now we still have to find the a value. And so what you'll do is you'll just grab a point that is on the graph. Now you probably don't wanna, you don't wanna take any of these values here because if you use any, any of the x intercepts, that's gonna end up just giving you zero equals zero. You're not gonna find the a because if you put x intercepts in here, all this becomes a zero. So you don't wanna use that point. But maybe this one, this one right here, we could go ahead and use instead. That's the y-intercept. And so a point that it goes through would be zero, negative two. So we're gonna grab that off of the graph. And because that's the one I can see that actually goes through a very clear point on the graph itself. The rest of these, I'm not exactly sure where it crosses. This one kind of looks like it may be negative two, negative two, two, but I wanna pick one for sure where I see it crossing the the y-axis, that's generally the one that you probably wanna go for here. So I'm gonna put this right here is the x value and then negative two is the f of x value. So I'm gonna put negative two in for f of x. And then I have x plus, I'm sorry, zero, bring a zero in for x. Zero plus four, zero plus one, zero minus two. Okay, so just put in that for all the x's. All right, so now uh, if you put all this in, we're gonna get uh, negative eight when you multiply this, because you get four times one times negative two, so negative eight. Divide both sides by negative eight, and we get negative two over negative eight equals A, um, or we can write that as one fourth. Okay, you're just dividing it by, uh, dividing that out. Okay, so now we have f of x is equal to one fourth. And then we have 
x plus 4, x plus 1, x minus 2. Okay, so all that right there uh, is going to be your polynomial that we have. Okay, from highest to, uh, all right, the order doesn't really matter how we write that. You should put the coefficient out front. So this is going to be the exact equation for this graph that we that we see right here. So again, it's a it's another variation of a problem we did earlier where we were given some zeros and we have a point that it goes through. Just giving it to you in graphical form instead. There's one of these that you're going to do in Lumen that'll be a multiple choice. So you can just choose the correct equation that goes along with the given graph. So that's another type of problem I'll give you. All right, so next thing we're going to do, uh, we got a little bit more time. We'll take about maybe another 10 more minutes or so. Uh, actually, a little bit more. I'm going to try and take some more time. Today, I may actually go the full uh, full time that we have, hour and 20, only because uh, you know, yesterday we had a little bit shorter lecture. I had to leave early. And so now we're going to go ahead and do uh, 4.2. We will start. And we'll try and see. If we, can, we might be able to actually finish this one because this is not a real long section. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and do that. So I have uh, graphing polynomial functions uh, here. So uh, what we're doing in this section is we're going to put everything together. We just, just learned in 4.1, which is why I like to do these two sections together because they, they're related. Uh, and combine some things together and we'll finally actually uh, do the graph. Now, the way I, I, I went ahead and I changed this section again, these notes are a little bit different than they were uh, like a week ago or even yesterday, because I want them to kind of be as close as possible to what Lumen is asking. So that way there's no confusion on this. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and teach the way the, the textbook kind of does as well, which I think is even a little bit better than what I had when I used to have in my notes before. So I uh, will go ahead and do that for this section. So uh, for this one, we wanna find the, the zeros multiplicities and then circle whether it crosses or touches. We'll do that for this first example. What you do is you just take each of these individually and set them equal to zero. Now you don't have to show work for this. You can just put the answers in for these. Uh, if I have an X that's sitting out there by itself, which means that uh, a zero is gonna be an X intercept that I have for sure. If I, make, if I make the X zero, the whole thing ends up being a zero. The middle one, uh, the part, the number that will make this middle term zero is gonna be a five. So that's gonna be a multiplicity or, um, zero of five, which is gonna go there. So I'm doing the zeros first, then we'll come back and do the multiplicities. Okay, so a five will make that zero. And then this one here, negative three is gonna make this third part zero. Okay, so here's my three X intercepts, zero, five, and negative three. The multiplicities are gonna be the powers that are associated with each of these factored pieces. The multiplicity are just the powers on each of these. So on the X, the multiplicity is a one. For the five, the multiplicity is a one. And for this last one, the multiplicity is also a one. All the powers on this are all ones. And that would be your multiplicity there. You wanna indicate whether it crosses or touches here. Okay, now since the multiplicities on these are all odd, every one of these are going to cross at the x intercept. So I know the graph crosses at that point. Now the uh, lumen is also going to ask this. It says the graph behaves like blank for large values of x. So we want to type in our answer for that. What you're going to do here is you're going to multiply the x's together. And so uh, if I multiplied out these last two, I would get if I multiply these together, I'm going to get an X squared. I'll have some other stuff that comes after it, but I'm only concerned about the leading coefficient. If I just multiply these last two out, I'll get X squared and some other stuff. Well, I have an X that's right here. So if I multiply the X and X squared together, okay, so if I multiply these together, that's gonna to give me X cubed. That's what I'm gonna put on the line right here. So if I, all I gotta do is just take the, I wanna find what the leading coefficient is, but you don't necessarily have to multiply out the entire thing. 
All we're doing is looking at what we're going to get for the leading coefficient, the coefficient, the, the term that has the highest power. That's what you're doing there. So x times x will give me an x squared. And I have another x there. So x times x squared will give us x cubed. Okay, so that's going to be our, our that's like our power function is what I mentioned earlier. That's what that means. The graph is going to behave like x cubed. Uh, generally is what that's going to look like. Okay. Now what I'm also going to do here is I want to I want to talk about the n behavior. We talked about this in the last section. We did those four different cases, and so in this for this case, we want to find what the degree is. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier, I'm going to go ahead and write right here is sum of multiplicities is the degree. The sum of the multiplicities is the degree. So if I want to find out what the degree is right here, I'm just going to add the multiplicities together. So in this case, the n is going to be equal to 3 on this particular problem. We can also see that by the fact that the power function we had is a power of 3. So that makes sense that that's the highest power we have. And so n is 3, which means that this is odd. The a sub n would be the number that, we, that comes in front of the x that has the highest power. If I were to multiply this out, the first two terms, I would just get a 1x squared, and there's a 1x. And so when I multiply that, I get a 1x cubed. So there's a 1 in front. So in this case, the a of n is, is 1. Uh, or actually, I don't even have to, have to indicate what the actual 1 is. All I'm going to do is just say that my a of n is greater than 0. And that's all I'm concerned about when I want to find my n behavior model. I need to determine whether the degree is odd or even. And then if, they, if the leading coefficient, that number in front of the x with the highest power, if that's positive or negative. And then I just take a look at my table, those four different cases, and I just find the one that matches what I have. I want to find the case where n is odd and a of n is greater than 0. Okay, well, the one that we looked at there, we take a look at the case. I'm going to come back to this, but let's go back to the uh, these right here. N is odd and A of N is greater than zero. That's going to be case number three, like that. Case number three, which means that it's going to go down and it's going to go up. Okay, now this is going to play into our graph right here because we know that it's going to it's going to do that. We know that we'll have, so first of all, let's go ahead and indicate the zeros here, the x-intercepts. It crosses at zero, it's going to cross at five, and it's going to cross at negative three. Now, in this case, I know that the graph is going to go down like this because of the end behavior, and then it's going to go up like that. So I know how the graph is going to at least start and end. Now I have to figure out what it does at each of these zeros. Now I indicated here that the, the graph is going to cross, which means that the graph is going to cross like that. So it means that I can go ahead and uh, draw this in like this. It's going, to, it's going to cross and go up like that. That's going to go up to a certain point. I don't really know how high this goes. We're just making sketches here on that. So it's going to curve and it's going to have to come back through this one, because it crosses that one, we don't have a, a bump there or a U shape, we don't have that. It's gonna go down to a certain point, it's gonna curve, and then it's going to come back up and then uh, do that. So that's how I can tell what the graph looks like. Also, each of these multiplicities are one, which means that it resembles like a line where it crosses each of these. So that's kind of how we do. We start with one end like that, and then we kind of follow it along through until we reach the other end. And that way we know kind of which way it's signing here. We know it has to go down. So we started by going down first. We know that it crosses. So it's going to be coming up like that. And it's going to cross at that point. Now, in order to be able to cross at the next zero, the graph would have to do a curve 
like this. So it's going to have to curve and go down like that. So the question is, well, how do we know it doesn't do like a curve, like, like two, two bumps there? Well, how we know that is we can talk about what our uh, maximum number of turning points are. If the degree is three, that means they can have at most two turning points. I know that there'll be a turn right here and a turn right there. We know it's not gonna do something crazy in between and go up, up and down and do some other weird stuff in between. Okay, so we know that it's gonna have to have a, only a massive number of two turning points, which it does have right here. So we have a curve right there and we have a curve, curves down below, it bends right there as well. And that's how you can put all this together and to be able to graph something like that. Okay, and this is what your final graph is gonna look like. Again, we're just doing sketches here. When we do these problems in Lumen, uh, you're gonna have multiple choice on these. So you don't have to try and graph this by hand because there's not, there's not tools in here that allow you to draw something like that. For the cube, yes, the cube, you can actually use a graphing tool. But again, um, we're, not, we're not going for exact graphs here. We're just going for quick sketches. So on, on the test as well, it's gonna be a multiple choice. So on this is multiple choice for choosing the right answer. Let's move on to the next example. So we'll do, we'll do at least one or two more of these, trying to do as much as we can before our class period is over. So that way you have most of the tools you need to do 4.2. Here's our equation. We have two times X minus three squared, X plus four squared. The first thing we're gonna do is indicate the zeros. Now, when, we have, when, you, when you're in Lumen, it's gonna give you the correct number of blanks to fill in for what the zeros are. So it'll ask you for what the zeros are, the multiplicities, and it'll ask you about each multiplicity, whether it crosses or touches, it'll correspond with uh, what you have here. Uh, the two up front, I cannot set that equal to zero. So the two is not gonna be one of my answers down here for the x-intercepts. It's gonna be, I'm gonna take the first parenthesis. If I set that equal to zero, I get a three. If I set this part inside equal to a zero, I get negative four. So I have three and I have negative four there for that one. Okay, next, the multiplicities are the powers that are attached to each of these factor pieces. Both of those are going to be uh, a two. So it's whatever makes the first parenthesis a zero, that's three. Whatever makes the uh, second parenthesis a zero, that's gonna go on the next blank there. Multiplicities are both even in this case. So because of that, the graph is going to touch at each of those. Okay. Next one I have the, uh, let's, do the, let's do the degree next and the maximum turning points. Remember that the degree is the sum of the multiplicities. Okay, so the sum of the multiplicities is your degree. If I add that together, two and two will give you a four. The max number of turning points is always one less than your degree, that's gonna be a three. You just take four minus one, that's gonna give you a three there. Let's do the y-intercept. Y-intercept means that you're gonna put in a zero for x. Let's put that in, we get y equals two times zero minus three, zero plus four. Okay, uh, so that we're going to work that out. And that's gonna give us two times uh, nine and then times 16 on the end there. If we put that into a calculator, you're gonna get 288. So the y-intercept uh, here, uh, in this case, you can just list the answer. You don't have to put it in a coordinate form. Uh, it should tell you that in Lumen whether you have to include it as a coordinate or not. And so if it doesn't say a coordinate, you'll just put 288. Otherwise, if it was a coordinate, you would put uh, zero comma 288 uh, for that. Last thing is what the, uh, what the graph behaves like. Okay, now let's talk, let's think about what this actually means. Now this first part right here, if I multiply out that one, 
I'm going to get x squared minus 6x plus 9. I'll get some more things, but I'm just concerned about what the, the lead coefficient is on that. It would be x squared. So I have x squared plus 6x plus 9, but anyway, that's going to be x squared. The second one, I'm going to get x squared plus 8x plus 16, but all I care about is the square that's here, and then I have a 2 that's in front. So if I multiply these together, I'm going to get 2x to the fourth power. Okay, so 2x to the fourth is what I'm going to get. This is what the graph is going to behave like. That's what I'm going to put in for my answer there. So again, how we know that? If you were to multiply all this out, which I, you don't have to, you don't have to multiply this out. But if you multiplied it, you would get x squared minus 6x plus 9. But I'm only concerned about the highest power for x squared. This one here, x squared plus 8x plus 16, but I'm only concerned about the x squared out front there. The two I have to also include. So I get 2x to the fourth. This is what the answer is going to be for the power function. The graph is going to behave like 2x to the fourth for large values of absolute value of x. Okay. That's what it will behave like. Once we have the power function, we can also determine end behavior, which I'm going to write below here. End behavior, what I have here is n, uh, n is even, and the a of n is the number that comes in front of the x with the highest power. We determine that whenever we find the power function. So in this case, my a of n is greater than zero. It's positive because the number there here, the number two is positive. So that's how I know that. The model here for that, if I were to look back at the previous section, okay, if n is even and a of n is greater than zero, the graph is going to open up on both ends like that. And we're going to use this on the graph itself. So it crosses the x-axis at 3. It also crosses that at negative 4. I know that way up here, now I know the scale is not going to be correct, but I know somewhere up here the graph crosses at 0 and 288. So we're going to kind of ignore the y scale here, ignore that. Uh, on this graph itself, I'll just go ahead and put a mark that the graph has to cross through that point. Now, what I also know about this is that the graph is going to go up like that, and it's going to go up like this because the end behavior tells us that the graph is going to do that. Now, notice at this point, the graph is going to touch at each of these. So what's going to happen is the graph is going to come down like this, and it's going to hit it, but it's, it's not going to cross through. It's going to do a bounce. It does a bounce there whenever it touches. Remember, I, I mentioned before that if the graph touches, it's going to look like a little parabola shape at that point. Now, from there, it's going to send the graph now all the way up to here. So it's going to go through and hit that point. I'm not sure, sure how high it'll go. It may go a little higher than this and then come back down to 288. Not really sure. Again, we're just doing sketches on this. And you'll just uh, get the right answer from Lumen by the multiple choice. Once it hits that, it's going to have to come back down here to this point, but then it's going to do a, a bounce shape here as well. Again, because of the, if it touches, it's just going to be uh, that kind of shape. And it's going to come back up like that. And so we get a big W shape here as a result. And that's what the final graph is going to look like. Okay, so that's the one you'll choose.